Occupation and Administrative Regulation. This is meeting number five. I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order. Madam Secretary, call the roll. Senator Adams. Here. Senator Douglas. Here. Senator Higdon. Senator Hornback. Senator Howell. Here. Senator McDaniel. Senator Neal. Senator Nemus. Present. Senator Thayer. Here. Senator Thomas. Here. Representative Banta. Here. Representative Bratcher. Here. Representative Birch. Here. Representative Flannery. Here. Representative Gentry. Here. Representative Heron. Representative Huff. Here. Representative Cook. Here. Representative Massey. Representative McCoy. Representative Meredith. Yes, Representative Miller. Here. Representative Moser. Representative Palumbo. Here. Representative Pratt. Here. Representative Santoro. Here. Representative Timoney. Representative Westrom. Co Chair Koenig. Here. Chairman Schickel. Present. Co Chair Koenig, do you have anything you want to uh, address yes, this morning? I have a couple of announcements. Um, the first announcement is our next meeting, we have changed the time to 10 o'clock. Uh, so it's normally we meet at 11, it will be at 10 o'clock. Uh, also, that will be the last meeting of the interim, so we'll, we will be honoring the members who are the outgoing members, so that is a meeting that you will not want to miss. Um, also, our staff here is so important, and we're all really very close on this committee, and uh, it's like family to me. And uh, Bryce Amberge, who's our head staffer, is really going through a crisis um, and has been for quite some time. His son is battling leukemia, and uh, Bryce has had to miss a lot of work. His son's name is Luke. Uh, I think today or tomorrow they're traveling to Children's Hospital up in Cincinnati for, uh, I believe, a bone marrow transplant plant if all the tests go. And it's just really, really been a tough time for him. Um, I have a card that I'm going to pass around that you all can sign uh, for Bryce and the staff will deliver to him. Also, if anyone would like an address to mail a card to uh, Bryce and his son and wife, um, they just have that one child. Um, uh, the staff will make that available to you. And at this moment, I'd like to just have a moment of silent prayer uh, for uh, Bryce and his family. Thank you. The first item on the agenda is the Kentucky Lottery Update. Good morning. You have uh, 10 minutes, and uh, after that, I'll, I'm sure there'll be some questions. There is. How about that? Loud and clear. I always do that. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Always a great opportunity to come before you all, and I'm always grateful for the opportunity to talk about the wonderful things that are going on in your lottery. So I would like to introduce the folks that I have with me today. Our chief technology officer is T.H. Morris on my left. On my right, I have Rick Kelly, Vice President of Finance and Administration. And on the far right, Ingram Quick, our Vice President of Audit. So with your permission, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to proceed with a financial update. And I will turn it over to Rick Kelly for that. Thank you, Mary. Good morning, everyone. Mike. Thank you, Mary. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, you should have a financial handout uh, in front of you. Uh, on page two, I'll start with the lottery business update. You should see some charts there. 
uh, that uh, review the last 10 years of lottery sales and transfers. Uh, you can see that uh, it provides a great visual of, of those sales and transfers over the last 10 years, showing steady growth with significant growth in the last two years. Um, on page three, um, we've got the numbers there on the lottery business update. You can see that we had record sales in uh, fiscal year 22 of $1.677 billion, and we transferred a record $360.8 million to the Commonwealth. On slide four, on page four, uh, you can see a visual representation of where the money goes. 69% um, of every sales dollar sold on lottery tickets goes back to our winners. Um, 21 cents gets turned over to the Commonwealth, and five cents gets turned over to our retailers and commissions. Five cents of that uh, every sales dollar goes to administration expenses. And just to sum up what we've had in the first quarter of FY23, we've had total sales of $425.1 million and total net income of $91.2 million. And that is ahead of budget. So we are in good position to meet the requirements uh, that the Commonwealth has for us this year. Okay. Thanks, Rick. And I'll also say that our financial position will be greatly helped by this jackpot that we have. You may have noticed that the Powerball jackpot is rather large. I believe it is the second largest at 800 million so just a public service announcement there so rick talked about the funds that have been generated and i understand that uh, we've been asked to elaborate a little bit on the use of those funds so on slide six or page six of your handout uh, we'll begin with a little bit of a background facts about the kentucky lottery we were created in 1989 and at that time, our funds went mainly to the general fund. In 1999, the General Assembly saw fit to direct those funds to specific scholarships and grants. So since 1999, that's what lottery funds have been used for. Since 1989, we've turned over $6.4 billion to the Commonwealth. And since 1999, of that, $4.4 billion has gone to scholarship and grant and other educational programs. The specific allocations are set by legislation, that's our statute, KRS 154A130, and each biennium with the budget bill. And for this uh, point, I want to emphasize that we really have no control over how those funds are spent. Folks come up to me after I speak, sometimes in engagements, that type of thing, they'll say, Mary, why can't you fund pre-K or K through 12, or you could really make a difference there. It's like, yeah, but that's the General Assembly's of responsibility and that is all set out in the budget bill. So what exactly is set out in the budget bill? And you can find that on slide seven is a list of the specific scholarships and grant programs that we fund. There's the popular key scholarship program. I know many of you have probably had children that have participated in that. I know I have as well. That's 100% lottery funded and it is merit based. The college access program is a need based program and the Kentucky tuition grant is also a need-based program for students attending private universities. The Work Ready Scholarship is uh, also funded by lottery proceeds. That is uh, allowing students at our community colleges to pursue degrees in certain high demand fields like uh, technology and healthcare. The Dual Credit Scholarship, many of your children probably have taken advantage of that. Uh, by uh, getting high, in high school, get, getting college credit without even going on a college campus. And then there's the two career-specific scholarships, the teacher scholarship and the National Guard scholarship. Those are directed, again, by the budget bill, and that's what Kentucky Lottery proceeds fund. So on slide eight, just a few more quick facts. Um, that $4.4 billion that's gone to education, has provided 2.43 million in scholarships and grants since 1999, 98 cents of every one dollar in student financial aid awarded uh, by the Commonwealth comes from lottery tickets, and 820,000 Kentucky students have received uh, a grant or scholarship that's been funded by Kentucky Lottery proceeds. And to that, I will add one more fact, which is one in five Kentuckians has now received a college scholarship or grant that's been funded by lottery proceeds. So years ago in 1999, when the General Assembly decided to direct our funds to these programs, the intent was specifically as to the key scholarship program to keep our high-performing students right here in the state 
to attend our universities and colleges. And the research that has been done since that time has shown that it is working. And we're very, very proud to be a part of that initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for coming here and doing this. Um, I had had some questions uh, and I'd talked to the chairman about, um, and it, it kind of came up in this past session. You guys were in here on some issues and were talking about that the lottery was so important to funding education for our students. And, and it is, I think that's the public perception of it, but I happen to be going through this process um, myself with, with teenage kids and the, the actual gap in, in what the money was available and the perception of it, there was, there was quite a gap in there. Um, one of the things that you just said is that Keys is designed to keep our high performing students at home. And speaking of one, I have, I'm blessed with a very high performing daughter and the amount of keys money that we were going to see. And I have to assume that she pretty much maxed out on this. And the, the amount of keys money available to her wasn't even a factor. We never factored that in at all into where she attended school, whether she attended in state or out of state. It wasn't, an, I, I don't remember the number, but it wasn't enough to even move the needle on this. And because this is my peer group right now uh, with parents with school-aged children that are moving on to college, when they, that, there's a misconception until they get to digging down into this that the lottery money is really going to help them and it's a rude awakening when they get to that point and they realize there's not a, a great deal of money to be deployed there. And it really isn't a factor at all in everybody I've talked to's decisions on this. And I know that's not the lottery's fault. That's just the, the, the natural issue of it. And that was one of the things that I wanted to talk about today. I provide, did some, some rough math uh, because I can still do that. Um, and the, the fiscal year 22 numbers that were provided, just taking a, a rough average, the average Keys recipient received $1,708.55, which when I went to school, was a lot of money that, that that would have been real for a public for one of our public institutions but i looked uh, on some of the websites for some of our schools without factoring in fees and everything some of the regional universities including the one in my hometown uh, the the total price is roughly twenty thousand dollars a year the u.s department of education statistics that go into this uh, a family household with less than $30,000 a year, the adjusted out cost is $9,339 a year. There's been a significant gap as education costs have increased and we've kind of flatlined our, uh, our, our funding on this. Um, we always talk about how cheap it was in, the, in our day and all these things that nobody in the present era wants to hear. But do you know how this for formula rep works as opposed to when it started is the keys money that's available been roughly the same in in real dollars but and they've just kind of lost their purchasing effect as they haven't kept pace with with uh higher ed inflation i think the best organization to go to for that information would be the kentucky higher education assistance authority because those uh, are the individuals that have been directed by statute to administer all of these scholarships. And I'm sure they would have that data for you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can I have a, just a couple of questions? You may, uh, Senator, uh, proceed. Um, some of the things that I, I looked at in the information you provided, and thank you for that, um, we always question about whether someone, how, how anyone's spending their money and your operations look lean, you have to t return money back. Is, is, are we looking at a situation where there's just simply not enough money available to make more of a meaningful impact with the way the legislation directs that this money goes? I mean, you, you're required to turn over all the excess money, is, is my understanding, correct? We are, and we do. And there, I'm assuming there are no hidden sacks of money buried down in, underneath your floors or anything like that. There are um, not. So, so we're really stuck in this situation as far as the lottery being able to provide additional funding for education at this point. 
again, it goes right back to the statute. The statute yeah. uh, is 154A130. It does direct that 55% of lottery funds go to those need-based scholarships, 45% uh, to the merit-based. Uh, after that, the budget bill controls how they are divided up. Okay. I believe that's all I have for now. <laughs> Thank you. We've got Thank three you. more people, and then I have an, another topic I want to bring up with you all. Um, uh, Co-Chair Caney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to uh, make a quick comment thanking uh, Mary and, and the staff at, at the lottery for um, the good work that, that they do on behalf of the Commonwealth, the citizens. Um, it's it's uh, it's been a you know a pleasure working with you all. And there's there is a lot of money, and obviously the, it's up to the legislature to to figure out where it goes. Um, and just to uh, follow up on a little bit of, of what Senator Hal had to say. Um, I think when this Keys program begun, um, and you know, Representative Birch can probably tell us this. I think the money largely covered the entire um, uh, tuition to go to an in-state university. So there's a lot to unpack there with regards to the inflation, as you mentioned. Um, but I think there's also a lot of um, um, options uh, in the education world to um, look at. I don't know if it's five or six years you're eligible to use that money when you go to college. Maybe it should be four and you can increase the amount that students get. Um, other ways to make sure that it's being used wisely and, and uh, maybe help increase and keep those students here. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Uh, Representative Cook. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, also dealing with the keys money, want to address a little problem that I have with it. Sorry, hiding behind the post here. But I think there's a stereo, strong stereotype. I don't just think. I know there's a strong stereotype in our high schools right now and the push to push kids to go and get that four-year degree. There are plenty of kids. And I ran a bill last year on this. I'm going to keep, keep working on it as well technical schools, vocational schools, like Representative Meredith said, EMS schools. I think it, I think we need to take a good hard look at it, open up that keys money to be available for those students because there are some absolute wonderful careers. Um, I'm a product of that myself. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Senator Thayer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mary, what is the minimum ACT score and minimum grade point average in order for a student to receive keys money? That is all set out on the KIO website. Um, I am sorry, I can't recite that uh, by verse, but it, again, that is all administered by the Kentucky Higher Education Assistance Authority. Uh, well, I wish you knew that, but I think I'm, I'm going to posit that it's, it's pretty low. And I wonder if we didn't increase the minimum GPA to like a 3.0 and increase the ACT score. If then getting at the situation that Senator Howell said, you'd have more money to give the kids who are deserving of merit scholarships. And I just wonder if, you know, giving a little bit of money to C students uh, isn't really getting away from the definition of a true merit scholarship. If this thing's gonna be a merit scholarship, we ought to consider putting it in statute that it is truly a merit scholarship and then you could increase the awards. I think staff's trying to, uh, yeah, 2.5 GPA and at least a 15 on the ACT. I mean, those aren't merit awards. You, you, are, you are correct. Those and are participation awards. And we're, and we're doing a disservice to the kids who score high on their ACT and work hard to get a GPA that's a B or better, and that gets to the point where these awards have become de minimis. I think we ought to consider changing it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. You. Senator Higdon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mary, thank you and your team for um, always being accessible if there's, a, if there's an issue. Um, Senator Howe talked about his peer group. My peer group is retailers, and I always wanted to put a plug in for them for um, fee increases that, that are what they what they get paid to 
to do the lottery. It's been 5%, and, and of course, their volume has increased. But my question is about, I, I hear a lot of commercials about your online lottery. You can buy a lottery ticket online now. <clears throat> Of course, you, you're not paying a 5% commission out for that. You get to keep that money, but you're, I guess, I assume you're accepting credit cards uh, for that for that transaction. So you have a credit card fee. Am I correct on that? You are. Okay. What is the percentage of online sales now compared to um, in-store or, or retail sales? For FY22, it was around 13% of our total sales. And also, in addition to the transaction fee associated with online sales, we do pay a much higher percentage to the vendor for operating that channel at 16.99% of net sales. So there are many additional costs associated with sales in that direction. Now, uh, you lost me there. You pay a retailer for online sales? We pay a vendor to operate the vendor. system because there's a system of player accounts and uh, geolocation and other functions that are necessary to operate that channel. Okay. Do you have any idea how much you're paying them percentage-wise? 16.9% okay. of okay. net sales. Okay. If you can afford to pay them 16%, you can afford to pay our retailers a little more. Please consider that. I Thank hear you. you. Thank you. Um, and now I'm going to turn the page. Um, I um, And I know I've talked to you all about this before, and that is the way the numbers are selected. And I know uh, during COVID, you got away from using the, I call them the ball machines for lack of a better word, uh, and, uh, and you got away from that, and the computers started uh, selecting the numbers. And I've asked about this numerous times, and I've been assured about the integrity of those computers uh, selecting the numbers. But for me, and I know you've done a study, and, and – uh, uh, the public was satisfied with the computers doing the numbers. I take issue with that. I know where I live, we don't have that kind of trust. And uh, the computers might be fine, um, but there was also uh, some entertainment, uh, in in entertainment value in that. And I just think it's one more thing that we did away with because of COVID. And then we decided, well, we're going to just keep on doing that way. And I just don't think it's the best way to do it, number one, for the integrity of the game. Number two, for the entertainment of the citizens of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, I think it's a big perception problem. And I think once the citizens become aware of this, it is going to be an issue. What say you? Well, thank you, um, Chairman Schickel. And you might have mentioned this to me before. So um, I had a little bit of a heads up this was coming. We provided a handout in your uh, packets and it has the label digital drawing update, if I may. Can I walk through that just real quick? I think it would provide some background that would be very enlightening on our use of automated drawings. Um, so on slide two is a little bit of the background concerning our use of digital drawings. So you hear words like RNG, that's random number generator, or digital drawing. Those are just fancy terms for the automated drawing. And just the short simple story is we went to automated drawings because in the beginning for the same reason as just about every other industry goes to automated functions it's to reduce the human error it's to increase efficiency it's to decrease costs and it's to make innovation possible and for us it offered heightened integrity and security so that's the bottom line why we went to uh, computer-generated drawings, and we... It didn't have anything to do with COVID? Well, okay, so the story's a little more complicated than that. We, uh, as set out on slide two, we actually started using an RNG 18 years ago. We decided that every new draw game that we started would use an RNG. And so there, in one at a time, we could see how it worked and get players accustomed to it. So I think we had actually run a total of eight games with RNG by the time COVID hit. You know, draw games come and go. Um, so by the time COVID hit, we were only using ball machines for three games. That's our popular pick three game, pick four game, and cash ball. Those were the only three games left using ball machines. So... Um, we also wanted to know, in connection with Chairman Schickel's question, we also wanted to know, and this is again just recently, um, like two weeks ago, we asked other lotteries what they were doing. And of the 46 lotteries in the contiguous U.S., 44 responded and 43 used RNG drawings for some uh, or all uh, of their drawings. So it's a very common use in other lotteries. 
Um, and they're also used in our other operations as well. Many folks, when they purchase tickets, they say, give me a quick pick. The numbers are generated for them. Those are also generated by RNG. So very common in the lottery industry. And on slide three, just a few background facts about what we've been doing uh, as far as using RNG. So Chairman Schickel's right, something happened during COVID. You know, remember where we were in April 2020, nobody could think of anything but that. So the health department comes knocking on our door, literally came down to our office and said, we understand you're doing drawings and you've got like several people that are in close quarters doing these ball machine drawings, still with pick three, pick four and cash ball, and we're gonna shut you down if you don't stop that. So we had to think of something to do and we had to think of it quick and it was easy enough to move those games to the RNG because they had already been backup for those games as well as used for a number of our other games. And Chairman Schickel's also correct, we did not move back. We didn't make that decision at the time, of course. We made a quick decision based on the health department being there. But over the past two and a half years, it's offered uh, many advantages to us and primarily heightened security and integrity. So on slide four, you can see a little bit of a snapshot of what our game situation looked like both before and after this switch in COVID. So what you can see is we did change pick three and pick four and cash ball from ball machine drawings to the RNG. But Powerball and Mega Millions, I just talked about Powerball being so high, those are still drawn with balls and machines. We don't do that. Those are multi-state games. Florida Lottery draws Powerball and Georgia Lottery draws Mega Millions. And those probably will be for the immediate future still drawn that way, but I can tell you both groups have talked about changing to RNG as well. Lucky for Life is another game that's multi-state. They went to RNG, that group that we participate in went to RNG in 2021. And then you have Keno and Cash Pop. Those are two games that have always been run by the RNG and cannot be run with ball machines because they run every four minutes. So it's just not possible. And you can see the revenues that are generated from those games there, very important to our revenue stream and can only be generated through uh, RNG drawings. And then on slide five, just a list. I don't need to go through all of them, but it's a list of the integrity and security controls that are in place with both our ball machine drawings and the RNG or digital drawing system. And you can see they're very, very, very similar. And I invite anybody to come down. We don't have anybody take me up on this, but I would love to show you, Chairman Schickel, or anybody uh, that's on this committee, I would love to show you our drawings. I just watched one yesterday. I have the procedures in front of me, many, many steps involved in these RNG drawings Thank done you. with two people. I invite anybody to come Thank down you. and take Thank a look. Thank you. I appreciate the invitation. Um, I believe, uh, Senator, did you have a question? Yes, I, I, just, I just, Mayor, I just want to follow up on what Senator Schickel said. I wasn't going to say anything, but uh, with with the Powerball, as you point out, being as high as it is, I was seeing something online on Tuesday that, that really kind of surprised me and worried me, so I will bring it up now. It was talking about what numbers appear more frequently than others. And, and, and I would think in, in, in the fairest game possible, they would all be the same, that you, you have random numbers, that they would all appear relatively the same. But, but, but to see that some numbers you know, have an appearance rate you know, that, that, is, that is statistically significant kind of shocked me on that. And so I would ask you to go back and, and talk to other states and see if there's some way where, where that can be fixed so that I know they talked about the Powerball number 17 appearing, you know, you know, statistically more frequently than others. I mean, I think I think that that raises concerns going back to Senator Schickel's point about the integrity of the game. Uh, and just to follow up from the senator, I don't have any worries about the integrity of the game. What I have worries about is, number one, the perception and your your own testimony to me kind of convinces me of what I'm saying, because what you're saying is really the bigger games, the multi-state games, and in the past, our big games in Kentucky, they they used the, the, the balls and the other ones were, were, were automated. That seems to me like a pretty good balance, uh, really. I know you have a lot of games and you probably it's logistically would be hard, but also, I mean, b back in the day when we watched some of these big drawings on television, wasn't there sponsorships revenue for that? 
it it was an entirely different ball game back then. People watched those drawings on television, but it got to the point where no one was watching, and the TV stations did not want to air those drawings anymore because no one was watching, so they came off the air. At that point, we began to stream those live. So the answer is no. They're not on television. It's No, but there's yeah. no sponsorships. There are none. Okay, thank you. Senator Thayer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to join the chorus with Senator Schickel and say I, I prefer the uh, old-style ball games, too, but I'm admitted old-fashioned, so, I mean, I still own a five-disc CD changer, so there you go. Um, I have a question about something I heard recently that the lottery might be looking into some form of paramutual game, and you may have presented it in, at an industry conference in Las Vegas. Is this just a bad rumor, or is it true? I, I haven't been to Las Vegas. <laughs> no, okay. I don't know anything about Good, that. Good, because the paramutual wagering is the purview of the horse racing industry, and I'd hate to see the lottery try to get into that business. Yes. Uh, one final question. You still have the same position on banning gray games that you had when you came before this committee last year? We felt like we needed to advise the General Assembly about what we were seeing this time last year, and we did that, and the, there was no ban passed. So we are concentrating on running the lottery the best way we can uh, for the time being. Those gray machines are um, still where they are, and we are working on, I think there was a numerous comments made, you just need to compete with them, so that's what we'll do. Representative uh, uh, Bratcher, you have the last say. Okay, real quick, just uh, I don't know if this committee's ever talked about the McMillian scam and uh, where McDonald's mo uh, monopoly was scammed and it was considered one of the most fail-safe security systems games in the world. And so my question is this, has there ever been any kind of uh, – and I'll just say the word because I can't think of an alternative, cheating in any kind of lottery games or whatnot in the whole United States that you're aware of, or maybe the whole world in modern times. You can Google and find any number of those kinds of schemes that have gone on out there. Um, so I'd have to say yes. I mean, it, it does go on. We are constantly looking at those and constantly updating our controls. That's why I asked uh, Ingram quick to come today because he is our auditor. If you want any more detail on that, Ingram, a part of his job is to look at that constantly. Make sure we have controls in place to prevent it. Every one of those that we find, we, we say, you know, could this happen to us? And we make sure we have the controls in place. He's to watching the games and who's watching him? <laughs> We have the state auditor to come in to watch him. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for being here, and uh, we, we appreciate it, and I'm sure you'll be hearing more, and uh, it's good to have you here. Thank you. Good to be here. Thank you. We are going to, um, at this time, I'm being told we need to approve the minutes from the last meeting. I'll entertain a motion. I hear a motion to approve the minutes, and there's second. All those in favor, use the voting sign of aye. aye. Anyone opposed, like sign. Let the record reflect that the minutes have been approved. We're going to number five on the agenda now, regional mental health centers. Good to see you, Sheila Schuster and Good Steve Shannon. You, no Mr. strangers Chairman. to this committee. and. Uh, Introduce yourselves for the record and proceed with your testimony. You have 10 minutes allotted for your testimony. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Dr. Sheila Schuster, and I'm a licensed psychologist and a policy consultant with the Kentucky Association of Regional Programs, known as CARP. Steve Shannon, the executive director of CARP, and I wish to thank Chairperson Schickel and Koenig and all the committee members for giving us this opportunity. I want to set the context here. In October of 1963, President John F. Kennedy signed into law the last bill he would ever sign, and it was the Community Mental Health Center Act. 
This legislation called for institutions, commonly known as insane asylums, to be emptied out so that the thousands of individuals with mental illness and intellectual disabilities could be treated in their home communities and not warehoused somewhere for years on end. I'm proud to say that Kentucky was the very first state in the nation to pass legislation, now in KRS 210, establishing a comprehensive system of community mental health centers that you all know as CMHCs to implement this dramatic change. And the key to that system was to assign each center to a geographic region, thus assuring that all 120 counties would have access to the full range of services and supports for mental illness, addiction, and intellectual disabilities, as well as to 24-7 crisis services. This map, which you have in your packet, brightly colored, shows you the 14 CMHCs and the counties assigned to each of them in their service delivery regions. And now Steve will provide more detailed information about the role of the CMHCs and the importance to the behavioral health safety net in maintaining their regional licensure. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, before, before he proceeds, um, and correct me, Sheila or Steve, if I'm wrong, because I want to make sure we get to what what has been, for lack of a better word, the controversy that we, I don't want to use up all our time. We don't have time to talk about what right. I perceive is the question that is on your mind, and, and that is the the the, uh, the issue of jurisdiction. Um, right. Uh, so let's make sure that uh, we, you know, we that we get to that in a timely manner, because I think that's what people are here for. Right. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Schickel. We'll skip to that area. Again, I'm Steve Shannon. I think that's a good idea. I got the message. We're, I'm the Executive Director of CARP Association of 12 of 14 Community Mental Health Centers. The question, as was, was framed, really is, is the CMHC, it's a regional system, is it a regional license? Our position is that it is a regional license. That license is valid within the region, delineated on the map you saw earlier. We base that upon existing statute and existing regulation. KRS 210-370-485 delineates the role, the statute, and that's, there's 14 statutes in that area, it delineates the roles of CMHC, board composition, relation with the cabinet. That section of statute on the LRC website is titled Regional Community Mental Health Program. The word region or re those words, regional, regional, is used 13 times in those 14 statutes. In our opinion, it's clearly a regional model. And that is what exists, regional model. Our licensure regulation issued by the Cadre for Health and Family Services, 902 KAR 2091, says direct or indirect services. We can contract with someone to provide services, or CMHCs can provide those services to the population of a designated regional service area, designated regional service area. Our Medicaid manual, CMHC manual, incorporated by reference in the Medicaid regulation, under conditions of participation, cites the licensure regulation that, again, designated regional service area. So the conditions of participation for a mental health center in the Medicaid program is contingent upon that service area. Two regulations promulgated by the Department of Behavioral Health, Developmental and Intellectual Disabilities. We have a close relationship with them. We are their network throughout the Commonwealth. We provide their services under contract with them. Two regulations, one reference regional, one reference geographical catchment area. Our position has been, statutorily and regulatorily, we are a regional model. Our license is valid in that region. To date, what is lacking is the delineation of the counties in each region, either in statute or regulation. We attempted this conversation in General Assembly 2018 with Representative Meredith Assistance to clearly state which counties are in which region. And I, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but I just want to make sure we get to the controversy, for lack of yes. a better word, because you had legislation last session. And right. I don't know how far. Did it pass either chamber? Passes the House. Okay. Okay. Um, is that 
there are um, mental health centers that are taking patients from outside their there area? There are two that are providing services outside of their designated region as a mental health center. They do not operate as a community mental health center outside of the region. One is in one other county. One is in 55 and now maybe 56 other counties, eight other regions. Okay, I think now would be a good time to ask, are there any questions or comments from any of the members? Representative Banta. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be dense, but if I keep hearing we don't have enough, we don't have enough, we don't have enough mental health care, can you just explain the problem with that? There, there are two entities. There are two entities that provide mental health services under uh, DMS. One are the CMHCs, the other are what we call BHSOs, Behavioral Health Service Organizations, of which there are 156, and they are they are all over the state, and they provide very limited but good mental health services. Our point is that if a CMHC goes into other regions and says they are a CMHC. They are, number one, paid at a higher rate, and people assume that they are providing the full range of services, which they are not. They also are not available to provide 24-7 crisis services, which is really what you count on your CMHCs and your public uh, behavioral health safety net to provide. So it's not a matter of um, personnel. It's a matter of what is their license when they're operating outside of their region. And our contention is that they should be operating as a BHSO because that's the service that they are providing in those counties, in those 56, 57 counties. Correct. Anyone else? Uh, would you? Oh, Representative Santoro, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So what you're saying in this day and age, with health care is out there, why would you want to limit access to mental health? We're not limiting access. The bill that was introduced and passed by the House creates a vehicle for those centers to become a behavioral health service organization. What we are doing is protecting access to services in all 120 counties and the obligation that mental health centers have in those communities. For example, tornadoes in, in uh, last December, the centers, I got a text, are the centers prepared to respond? Flooding, are the centers prepared to respond? That is what we do in addition to services. So we're not restricting access to services. We're saying get the appropriate license if you do that because you're not a mental health center there. That center's out of region. They did not have an obligation to respond to community crises. It makes us different, the behavioral health organization, perfectly. The secretary last week at the Cabinet for Health and Family Service Structure Operations Administration Task Force said, Centers that wish to go out of the region should do so as a BHSO. So the cabinet secretary supports that premise. Get the license, provide the services. We're not saying you can't do Thank that. Thank you. Uh, as usual, questions, uh, people would then think of other questions. And we have Representative Meredith, and then after that, Senator Howe. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I think the key here is it's not about limiting the service being provided. It's about making sure as... CMHCs get a higher rate of pay for providing wraparound full 24 hour, seven day a week coverage here. What the two that are operating outside of their area are doing is they're using the loophole of what they are, they are in their region to get a higher rate of pay outside Elsewhere. of their region without providing the full wraparound 24 seven crisis services that are out exactly. there. Correct. And it's just getting everything back on the correct playing field. The, the license that we passed in the House would allow them to continue to provide through the BHSO process. Mm -hmm. uh, they just would not get that increased uh, reimbursement rate that they get by virtue of covering everything that they're supposed to cover as a CMHC. Senator Howe. Uh, just to follow up on Representative Meredith's uh, comment there, the, the, the natural extension of that, uh, we use colloquial terms, does it allow them to kind of come in and cherry pick services? Correct. And then that Absolutely. weakens the people that are having to provide the wraparound services. It weakens their fin fiscal viability so they can't hire as many people and, and take care right. of that. And would require them to be BHSO, force them to provide all wraparound services? And, no. And no. Would it not? Nope. No. BHSO so, provide 
whatever services they wish to provide. Okay. So yeah, and, and I think you've hit on it, uh, Senator Howell. There's very thin margins for the CMHCs, and you can imagine that if you're providing wraparound services for someone with a severe mental illness, you're, it's costing you much more to provide that service than, say, providing services in a school. And what this CMHC is doing is cherry-picking those uh, less uh, intensive services that are still paid at a higher rate, so they're taking away the margin for the CMHC in that region, while the CMHC in that region is still having to provide the full range of 24-7 crisis services. So, Mr. Chairman, if I may just... You may. Proceed. So really what we're seeing is a lot of, like our prior presentation a lot of, in a lot of ways. A lot of things we see seem to be one thing, like th th we need more services. So why, what is the harm of letting people right. broaden out? But then when you dig down a couple of layers and peel off a couple of layers of that onion, we show that it actually restricts access to services because it weakens the, those entities that are struggling to make it anyway by taking some of the revenue stream right. out. Okay. Thank, exactly you. Thank right. you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Senator McDaniel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Steve, Sheila, thanks for being here. Um, which which uh, organization is actually causing the issue? Mountain Comprehensive Care Center. Mountain is, okay. And what counties are they extending into? They are, I don't have the list of 55, but they are in eight other regions. I, I'm sorry. From, okay, so it's, it's not just adjacent counties to No, the no, no. They actually have operations. Are, in, are they a member of your organization? They are not. They're not. Okay. And, but they have other contracts with the state, right? Yes. Here's what I'm asking. Here's where I want to get to is, is it, um, you're asking us to do something that's previously not been done. You guys have been around for 40. Uh, actually um, start operations, 1966, 1964, so the general assembly created our statutes. 58 yeah, years. We're pushing Here, here's, what, here's what I'm asking. We have one bad actor. And we're looking at a legislative change that might not that might have more significance than we necessarily anticipate. Is there a better lever to pull on? And in fact, I worked with the previous Bashir administration when we had all that trouble with seven counties not mm -hmm. paying their pension bill, right? Is there not a better lever to pull on than an entire statutory change that may have some ripples that we don't necessarily anticipate right now? Um, Brief history, we started this conversation with the cabinet. We, we were asked to submit a letter in 16. We had conversations in 19, maybe 18 after the legislation to do a regulatory change. Steve, hey, let, me, let me say this. Yeah. I know the chairman runs a tight ship. Yeah. We're going to be short, and you always have great history. Thank to you, Senator. I'm sorry, um, but, but just to answer, let, we let's tried have a the regulatory change. We tried that. Okay. We were yeah. advised at that point to do a statute. Right. J just continue to ponder on that before we do something that might have some ripples. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. And uh, I'm going to let Representative Mosier have the last question or comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for bringing this. It seems like we talk about this in every committee. So <laughs> I know that uh, I worked on this mm -hmm. uh, great right. deal with yeah. you last year. Are we talking about the original bill that was filed last year? without any of the, the no, amendments No, no, we're suggested. talking the bill passed by the House, the amended version. Okay, okay, okay. Because that really addressed the issue of um, the CM CMHCs who were going out of their district right. and allowed them to, uh, through uh, coordination with the cabinet or, you know, really getting approval for uh, it, to, to go into another region if a need was not being Correct. met. Correct. So, okay, I just wanted to make sure that we were still talking about yep. that. Yeah. Very okay. much so. Thank right. you, Perfect. and thank you for being thank here. You. Uh, we appreciate it. Always good to see you, too. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate you're, your you're, attention. You're, you're very welcome. I want to share with the members, we have two members that wanted to add things to the agenda that are currently not on your agenda, and I always give difference to members on the committee, so we're going to go ahead and try to do that just so don't leave. Um, the next item on the agenda we'll take is number six, ABC licensing fees. I see Senator Hickton is in the queue and ready to go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know time is valuable in, in this committee. Thank you for allowing me to, to speak this morning. Um, one of the um, several years ago in a, in a committee meeting when a licensing fee through ABC was, was brought up, I asked the question, the fee I think was $300. How do we come up with that fee? And the answer is, we don't know. 
uh, we kind of reach up in the air and grab something what sounds good and without any any um, I guess background of what it costs to, to administer those fees and and whatnot so this is um, this is just a, a, a opportunity resolution to work with ABC to look at those fees because they are revenue generating um, self-sustaining um, uh, group uh, commend uh, Commissioner Alice, uh, Allison Taylor and her crew they're always available to answer questions and this is not necessarily directed at anything that's going on but just to take a better look at um, and I understand that resolutions in our folders it, it is in the folder yes uh, and so we should be prepared to vote for this or against it in the session we uh, I'll file this bill and I think we'll have I'll have a lot of conversations with the uh, ABC and 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 Commissioner Taylor and we'll come up with something that uh, works for everybody well, uh, thank you so much, and, uh, and thank you for filing with the committee so we can all look at it. Uh, and uh, I see you have someone seated to uh, your left, uh, my right, that I think also has business that may not be on the agenda, but we want to cover it if we can. That's, that's correct. Ms. Campbell is here with us today from the Cosmetology Board. Um, and we, we have passed numerous, numerous um, compacts. And this compact that we were proposing today, and we don't have the legislation uh, finished yet. We have a we have the information that we need, but it's a for a co cosmetology um, compact, and um, this has been requested by the cosmetology uh, board and by the um, the military folks, Kentucky National Guard uh, and the um, regular army uh, for Kentucky to be more uh, move us to always. Um, trying to be military friendly, this would help um, help them also. So that's, I'll let um, Ms. Campbell say a few words about it. And and I, I, Mr. Ms. Ms. Campbell, Chairman, do you have anything to add that uh, Senator Higdon has not I've, already said? I've told her to be brief. <laughs> uh, no, Mr. Chairman, not specifically. We're excited about this. It's the first non-allied health um, compact legislation to be put together. We worked really hard on it. The Department of Defense did grant CSG the uh, the funds for that, and uh, we are sorry that we weren't here earlier. We just got the final draft on that language this last week. Well, we'll look forward to seeing the draft language, and uh, thank you for your testimony here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Next item on the agenda is item number four, the nursing shortage in Kentucky. Welcome. Good to have you here. Introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. I'm Dr. Brittany Welch. I'm Kentucky Nurses Association Governmental Affairs Cabinet Chair. I'm a Board of Directors member, Kentucky Nurses Action Coalition, Director at Large, and Director of Clinical Education for Galen College of Nursing. I want to thank you all for inviting the KNA to share the sentiments of the largest profession um, throughout Kentucky. We're here to share the voices of 90,080 nurses as of today. The infographic uh, you receive points out that nurses are the largest profession in the state of Kentucky, but we're st still experiencing a 36% shortfall. As I'm sure you know, the nursing shortage did not start with the pandemic. The pandemic only exacerbated the shortage, and unfortunately, if we do not address the nursing shortage now, the shortage post-pandemic will be unattainable. As we live longer, there must be more nurses to care for us. The current and future shortage guarantees we will not have those nurses in service unless we make the commitment today. A recent study from Georgetown University reports that 23% of nurses age 55 and older plan to either leave nursing or reduce their volume of clinical work. An article published by Modern Healthcare that touted an innovative way to address the pipeline shortage to include tax credit for nurses who mentor students. What impact do you think this may have in Kentucky if offered to nurse educators and nurse mentors? One of the major issues the KNA wants to address is the inclusivity of all nurses in addressing the shortage. 
We realize that if nurses stay local and serve their community, they deserve recognition, regardless of where they work. The list includes hospital nurses, hospice, long-term care nurses, nurse anesthetists, school nurses, public health nurses, rehabilitation nurses, those who work in doctor's office, APRNs, and of course, nurse educators, nurses. Shortages of nurses are occurring wherever nurses work. One year ago, the KNA surveyed nurses throughout Kentucky in order to identify what is currently most important to Kentucky nurses regarding work, safety, emotional health, physical health, and professional stability while confronting the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic and a sample of over of 850 nurses. The sample was rich with experience, with 61 possessing 21 to more than 30 years of experience. One fourth of the sample indicated it was likely they would leave their current position within the next three months. That's critical. Three fourths were unsure or unlikely to leave soon. Respondents identified both financial and non-financial implications for the nursing profession. It's understood that many of the identified factors rely heavily on the availability of financial resources in order to support the nursing workforce, such as availability of additional staff. Highly rated explanations have financial implications included insufficient nursing and support staff and not enough pay or financial incentives. Those were primary contributors to the nursing shortage in Kentucky. 73% cited lack of sufficient nursing staff, heavy patient loads, and 41% cited not enough pay. Nurses also offered non-financial explanations such as exhaustion, lack of breaks, lack of support, lack of voice and influence as contributing factors to the nursing shortage. 22% cited lack of support or staff. 22% also support, cited lack of support for nurses from management and administration. The 2012 to 2024 Kentucky Occupational Outlook Report projects the state will need an additional 16,000 RNs by 2024. This is 36% more than what was estimated for 2014. Can you imagine the actual need now after the pandemic? Just recently, the Kentucky Hospitals Association re released a report stating that hospitals in Kentucky will need 13,000 nurses just to staff existing needs currently. In conclusion, the KNA ask is to show nurses that they are of value and appreciated by doing any or all of the following and share with your colleagues, your neighbors, and your friends. Start and keep the conversation going that it costs $46,000 to replace an existing nurse. That's reported by the Becker's Hospital Review. Turnover and the loss of the nurse is very costly. How do we retain nurses that we already have? If we now need 16,000 nurses to fill the shortage and it costs 46,000 nurses to replace that vacancy, that's astronomical healthcare cost. Work with healthcare administrators to ensure they are valuing nurses by including them in decision making. Nurses are very well educated and they're capable of making these Thank decisions. You. Ask healthcare administration colleagues what they are doing to retain their current force. Assist patient and families with access to care issues by considering lifting restrictions on APRN practice. Help Kentucky retain their APRNs. Help keep nurses safe on the job, focusing on workplace safety initiatives. Invite nurses to answer questions and propose solutions. The shortage of nurses is far from over and we must start with the retention of nurses we have to keep working towards filling the pipeline. And in an effort to fill the pipeline, we must adequately pay faculty to educate nursing students. Help KNA address the nursing shortage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. I'm a little bit confused. Uh, do, are you representing the Kentucky Nurses Association? I am. Okay, thank you. Um, that be, and you work at the Galen College of I Nurses. do. Okay, great. Thank you. Are there any questions? Representative Mosher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your presentation. Um, it's always helpful as a, as a retired nurse to um, get an update, although this is not 
this is not um, a very cheerful update. I'm wondering, uh, you you talked a little bit about the survey that was done, and you ran through the numbers. Can you provide that survey and the results to the the committee so we can Absolutely. actually take a look at at what those responses are and Absolutely. and the um, you know the various breakdowns? Because I'm curious about the breakdown between the practice of nursing uh, by RNs, BSNs in hospitals um, and various you know, practice areas versus the practice of APRNs. I'd like to see you know, the breakdown in numbers and where the actual shortage is in, in you know, hospital care. And then um, my question is, do you attribute the, the shortage in nursing, um, no matter where it is, what, to what do you attribute that? Is it population growth? Is it, is it aging population? Is it the increased acuity of, of our patient population? What do you see? I think that's a very good question, and I think that's a multifaceted question. Mm -hmm. I think we have a, an aging pop population, um, and we have a pipeline issue. Um, with nursing. We have a decrease in availability of nursing faculty um, and MSN prepared nurses um, that contribute to the overall availability of uh, nurses throughout the state of Kentucky and really throughout the U.S. Right. If I may ask one. You um, may proceed. Thank you. Um, so, I, I mean, a couple of things, but I guess um, my primary question would be, uh, do you, uh, you know, many hospitals are requiring that, that our RNs with a BSN go on to get their master's or PhD. I, I mean, do you see that that's contributing to some of our, our basic healthcare needs? Um, so again, I think that um, that has ebbed and flow, especially with the crisis during the COVID pandemic. Um, we hit a, a period of time where our hospitals were requiring, um, especially with striving for magnet recognition, they were requiring for higher levels of educated nurses. Now with the nursing crisis, we are seeing um, higher LPN utilizations in our acute care hospitals, um, which is helping to fill the vacancy. However, since we have that underlying pipeline crisis, we still have a pipeline crisis so regardless of what type of uh, utilization we're seeing whether it be LPNs, RNs, BSNs, MSNs we still have that underlying crisis. Yeah I understand and and you know I, I would love to help with the pipeline the talent pipeline finding a way to increase this again this is one of these topics that we talk about in every committee it seems. Um, so, you know, I think that there are curriculum issues. I think that, you know, that it is multifaceted. Um, but I thank you for, for this presentation. I look forward to uh, taking a look at the survey to, to really dig down on this. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, you. thanks. Senator Dr. Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Welch, I want to thank you so very much for being with us this morning. Um, I, I do want you to know that <clears throat> No one in the General Assembly would ever question um, our nurses' education level, their knowledge, or their dedication to their profession. So I just want to take that off the table so, you know, we don't have to have a lot of conversation about that. Um, you indicated that 25 percent, at least the study did, uh, in October 2021, uh, the nurses said that they were uh, likely or extremely likely to leave uh, their job. Can you give me any information on what that percentage actually left in those three months? Um, I cannot at this time. That's is, is there is there any way I could possibly get those numbers? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Uh, it doesn't look like there's any more questions. Thank you so much for your informative uh, presentation, and we appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Senator Gerald Neal, do you want to present from your seat or go to the table? I believe there is a presenter here in the audience. I'm, there she is. Very I'm, well. I'm Come, up. Senator Neal's guest is always welcome in this committee. Senator Neal, you're going to go down and join her. Very well. Welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. 
First of all, thank you, Chairman Chico, for adding this to the agenda and allow us to speak. I know the time is short, so we're going to go right straight to the point I have with me here. Go ahead. I have with me Katie Cowan, who can give you the the, the, the nuances and all the details. So what I'm going to do to expedite things is say exactly what this is in terms of legislation and let her expe express uh, other aspects of this. The legislation uh, that's uh, before you is the intent of the act is to uh, guarantee the professional conduct on the part of uh, musical music therapists to assure the highest degree of professional, I'm sorry, to assure the highest degree of professional conduct on the part of musical music therapists, uh, to guarantee the availability of music therapy services provided by a qualified professional to persons in need of those services, and to protect the public from the practice of music therapy by unqualified individuals. This particular bill will create a licensing board for professional music therapists. It will prohibit any persons not uh, licensed under this board from holding himself or herself out as being a licensed professional music therapist, and it will authorize the board to promulgate administrative regulations necessary to carry out the provisions of this act. I may point out that there are 15 other states that have gone in this particular direction. It's consistent with what we now do as it relates to art therapists, and the protocol and regimen that is uh, before you or is being offered is consistent with what we do in, when we uh, deal with the questions of our establishing licensing boards. And I appreciate you having this rough draft for us to look at. I always like to have draft language. I know there might be some changes. Yes. Good to have draft language. And uh, does your guest have, want to testify? I would uh, certainly uh, offer the opportunity, if you will. Introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Welcome. Oh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, my name is Katie Cowan. I am the co-chair of the Kentucky Music Therapy Task Force, and I currently work as a professional music therapist at Norton Healthcare in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, I want to start off by saying thank you for Senator Neal for inviting me today and for the members of the committee for listening. He's got a lot of pull with this committee, you know that. <laughs> um, music therapy is an established and evidence-based healthcare profession. We work in hospitals, hospice agencies, and schools. Music therapy allows premature infants to thrive, supports the recovery of our military veterans, and helps decrease pain and nausea for our Kentuckians battling cancer. There are currently two programs in our state educating professional music therapists. This would be the University of Louisville and University of Kentucky. And our desired outcome is to increase access to safe and competent music therapy services for individuals throughout our state. As Senator Neal said, um, currently there are 15 states that recognize our professional we credentials. Don't we do not repeat testimony, just oh, new things. Thank you. I will not. Um, our most recent state to represent uh, state licensure is Illinois in 2022. Um, licensure has a positive impact on employment opportunities for professionals in our state, creates jobs for new graduates from our in-state institutions. It also provides quality music therapy services to our Kentuckians. This bill is important because it allows for licensure of board-certified music therapists after they have completed an approved degree program and the necessary 1,200 hours of clinical training creates a board of licensure. Uh, um, to help uh, support best practices, disciplinary actions and enforcement of law, thus holding our professionals accountable and pr helping to provide quality and safe music therapy services to some of our most vulnerable Kentuckians. Once again, thank you so much. And Katie, thank you for being here, Katie Cowan. And I believe we have a question from Senator Thomas. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and really more of a comment. Senator Neal, I want to applaud you for bringing this bill. I, I personally know that the University of Kentucky's medical system, uh, uh, both the, the Marquis Cancer Center, their Kentucky's Children's Hospital, uh, and their other hospital facilities, use musical therapy uh, in the treatment of their patients. And, and, and I can tell you the patients really appreciate that. It has shown tremendous benefits to the patients that come through the UK Medical Center. Uh, and it's been a real plus for, for 
uh, the medical center and the patients that, that they see and they treat. So this, is, this does work, and I applaud you for bringing this bill. Thank you. Anyone else? Katie and Senator, thank you for your presentation. Thank you, Chairman Schickel. Yes, thank oh, hold you. Hold on a minute, Senator Nemus. Uh, is this covered by insurance? If we get a state license, then yes. And if a state license would allow us to build insurance, which would thus create more ability to thank provide you. services. Anyone else? Thank you for being here. Thank you. Don't forget, next meeting's 10 o'clock, not 11 o'clock. Try to be here. We'll be honoring uh, the members that are leaving the committee without objection. We stand adjourned.